This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you. This is uh, really a privilege to be back at Cornell University in this very same room. To, I've heard, have memories of uh, very distinguished speakers and uh, learning from them. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Is this loud enough? Am I, is it in a good position? Okay. Um, so uh, I'll just go ahead and get started and try attempt to leave as much time as possible for discussion. So let's see. Am I doing this right? Hmm. It's not moving. Let's see if it's capable of moving. Hmm. Okay, we may have to stand here. Okay, good. It is working. Okay, so first of all, I, I like to start with a list of all the private sector funding I've received to talk about genetic engineering and, and uh, CRISPR. And that is the list right there. <laughs> so this is important because, I, you know, in fact, I've never done CRISPR, so never engineered a plant. So I'm an outsider to this field, and I think that gives me um, a certain degree of perspective, which might be helpful. Um, having received funds to do genetic engineering is not a uh, is not a problem. In fact, that's how you become experts. But I, I, I can say honestly that I don't have any conflicts of interest in this area, and I and it, it because it's so controversial. I think it's important to to make sure that's clear. Um, so my motivations, uh, I've learned that it's, it's probably good to uh, be explicit about my motivations. And I believe that the, the wise use of CRISPR technologies and, um, and genetic engineering uh, contributes to the common, or can contribute to the common good through increased food security and more sustainable food systems. That's my motivation for coming to Cornell. Well, through the Alliance for Science, most of all in this case, but for this as well. So this is the outline, um, I'm, and, and it looks like a lot, but we'll get through it because some of these topics are rather short. Uh, CRISPR, genetic engineering and disease resistance, and you can, you can read it for yourselves. Starting with CRISPR. I wanna just say a few things about it. First of all, plant transformation has been accomplished uh, largely by two technologies that have been very useful. One is to use agrobacterium, a natural genetic engineer, to uh, to uh, basically transform plants. And the second was to use uh, the gene gun particle bombardment. A lot of you are very familiar with these. Uh, these. And I'm, am I still speaking loud enough if I talk like this in the back? Okay, good. Um, so, um, so those have been useful technologies in introducing genetic constructs of interest uh, in random locations uh, in the genome, but uh, nevertheless useful. CRISPR, I think, um, first of all, let me explain it briefly and then, and then distinguish it in, in, in from plant transformation. There are two elements to the CRISPR nanomachine. I guess we could think of it as that. I've heard it called that. The orange, um, whoops, oh, I muted it. Okay. All right. So the orange um, bubbly thing is, is the Cas9 site-specific nuclease um, and the, the um, the gray to green structure there is the single guide RNA. And working together, the RNA, guide RNA, leads the Cas9 to a particular site based on Watson-Crick-based uh, Watson uh, based pairing. And it cleaves at a particular location uh, on that, uh, in that double-stranded DNA. And so that's what, the, that's what the, CRISPR, the Cas9 single guide RNA does. But it's what happens after that results in, in uh, gene editing. And, um, and so now we've got a double-stranded break, and so the, uh, the, the cell is going to repair that uh, you know, as quickly as possible, uh, sometimes often introducing an, uh, an insertion or a deletion of a small number of nucleotides. And I'll, I'll refer to why that's important in just a few minutes. Um, if you include into the same cell a, um, a, uh, a uh, template, that has homology to both sides of this uh, cut, but has this blue gene that's new, then you can introduce a, an additional genetic construct into, into the breakpoint. So if we were to imagine that that blue gene that we've introduced has some value in terms of conferring disease resistance, then, um, then that would be easy to imagine that that could contribute to disease control. Um, this one here, though, I want to comment on because we're introducing uh, indels into a gene that, that um, you know, and so we're causing disruption to the, 
the, the gene, but um, why would that be important? Because if you, if you target a susceptibility gene with a, with, and, and introduce an indel there, then um, if you've done that across all homeo alleles for that plant, this is weed in this case, which is a hexaploid, then you've created a, a resistant plant. Okay, and this is one of the ways that actually this is being used. So we've got two ways, general ways that could introduce disease resistance. There are multiple ways that the, uh, the CRISPR, the, the Cas9 um, single guide RNA can be introduced into a eukaryotic cell. But the one that, uh, without going into those in detail, I'll leave, leave more time for discussion. But the one that caught my attention the most is represented here. And so this is actually where a, uh, th there's no introduction of DNA into the plant. It's just the uh, combination of the um, Cas9, represented as purple, the Cas9 enzyme, and the uh, single guide RNA, and those are uh, joined together in a, in a ribonucleic nucleo, uh, protein, um, which can be transfected into protoplasts or introduced by the gene guide. And, and again, that's been described as DNA-free gene editing. So I think it's just an interesting concept. But there are other ways that, that uh, the, the Cas9 and the single guide RNA can be introduced. Another thing I think is notable about the CRISPR uh, gene editing is, is um, people have successfully multiplexed with multiple single guide RNAs. So we can actually target several genes at one time in the same cell. And so what are some of the important features of, of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing? First of all, most important I think is the precision. This introduce, uh, introduces very targeted and specific breaks that occur at specific locations or insertions that occur at uh, defined locations. And that distinguishes it from the, the um, previous forms of, of plant uh, genetic engineering. It introduces flexibility because not only are we introducing a particular gene, but we can delete a gene, we can delete a, f a fragment, we can uh, use targeted mutations or create targeted mutations. So there's, there's, there's more that you can accomplish than, than previously. Um, generally reported by researchers as a predictable type of technology. This is what I read. And again, I see researchers re commonly referring to it as uh, democratizing uh, genetic engineering because it's rather simple, that it's rather simple to uh, apply. I, that has been subject to discussion. I've heard a, a researcher once say, well, once a recently actually said, well, you actually have to optimize CRISPR for every given plant species. So maybe, maybe it's really no different in this respect than plant transformation, but enough people have said it that I, I think it's worth at least mentioning. The one um, wrinkle that I, I think is worth talking about, and, and hopefully we'll have time for others as, as you wish, but um, is this, this concept of off-target mutations. And so here we have uh, the, the guide RNA represented in a, in a DNA strand, um, that, that, is, that is the RNA that will guide the CRISPR to a particular target. Okay, so there's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to match this sequence completely. But there are other parts in this genome. This is uh, rice, right? This is, there are other, other locations in this genome where there's not quite a perfect match, um, but there is the possibility of, of, of annealing of the single guide RNA, resulting in a, in a break, a cut, uh, in a target that is not actually the target for the, um, for the RNA. And so these are called off-target uh, mutations. Okay, and, and if you read at least the popular literature, there is, they, they're raised as concerns. I don't think they, they are. I published this in a blog and had it peer-reviewed, um, but, uh, but these are the reasons. First of all, in plants, what I see in the literature is that the reported off-target rates are, are quite low. And, um, and there's additional papers that I can cite now and add to that uh, number of 13 citations. So it seems pretty uncommon in plants. There are strategies for reducing uh, off-target mutations, and these continue to be published. Off-target mutations, number three, can be monitored. You can find out if they're there, right, through whole genome sequencing. Four, in sexually reproducing crops, undesired mutations can be segregated out. And most of all, it, I, I think it's, it makes a lot of sense in a clinical situation for human disease control and th therapeutics to, uh, to avoid 
off-target mutations if we possibly can. But with plants, I, I, I'm not sure I see the risk because in breeding of all sorts, there is a lot of off-target changes beyond the particular genetic change that we're interested in. And that never has raised a, a concern. I think if there are off-target mutations, and frequent though they might be, that are detrimental to the plant, we select those out. And, that's, and then that's it. Now, I do want to bring attention to this paper here, which is just published a few weeks ago. Uh, actually, not published. It's in a preprint server, so it's, uh, it's not been published in a journal. Um, but, uh, but they documented seemingly um, in a, a well-done way, to my eye, of translocation and, and chromosome duplication, portions of a chromosome being duplicated. They documented both of those as a result of CRISPR-Cas9 editing in Arabidopsis. Um, so I, I still think the same response applies. It, is that a problem to, in plants, particularly since we, we select and we test the progeny? But I think it's an area that's worth paying attention to and certainly researching. So, uh, so we'll see where this leads. Okay, genetic engineering and disease resistance. We'll flash through just a few slides. First of all, I, I published a... Um, a paper in the journal Sustainability on genetic engineering from my perspective as a plant as an applied plant pathologist and went through and actually described the different strategies. Well, maybe I'll show that. This is open access, by the way, if you're interested. Um, okay, so um, these top, what I think, 10 um, strategies were described in the paper and cited for exa with examples. Um, and then promptly within a few months, uh, of publication, there were a couple more strategies that were published. The point is that there are, there is quite, and within each of these strategies, you have a pretty wide landscape of possibilities for engineering disease resistance. So, and, and, and so we've got, we've got a dozen at least, right, strategies for engineering resistance. And I, and I want you to be impressed by the possibilities. That's not to say there aren't concerns, but but there's a lot we can do, we know we can do already. Maybe not all of it would be workable in the field, but some of it would. So my conclusion from the literature and talking to experts is gene editing, it seems to be capable of providing all the transgenic and all the cisgenic types of resistance that have been published uh, as a result of genetic engineering. And it can also provide targeted mutations, large deletions, and allele substitutions, so which, which was not, to my knowledge, possible before. Okay. Genetics and crop pesticides. So this goes, this is going to draw on my experiences as a, as a applied young plant, applied plant pathologist in Dr. Lorbeer's program. First of all, um, I'll talk, uh, uh, maybe I should point out that among the three categories of, of pesticides, there's uh, herbicides, which is the largest category of, 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 of use of herbicides. These are old data, but still, we're, we're in the ballpark here. Insecticides and miticides represent the second category, and fungicides and other chemicals um, for disease control are represented in the third category. So let's take the first one, and that is herbicide-tolerant crops. So, or herbicides, could, how could CRISPR play a role in reducing herbicides is the question. And one way might be to engineer plants for herbicide tolerance, okay? That's one possibility. So if we look at a recent um, review paper on the use of CRISPR research or publication of res uh, results in, in uh, using CRISPR, yield was the principal focus, biofortification was, was number two, and number three is herbicide tolerance, basically. So pretty high on the list, and I know of the large-scale manufacturers are using this in their research programs to create plants that are resistant to herbicides. So let's look at the experience with round, Roundup Ready crops, glyphosate-tolerant crops, and that's, that picture tells it all. These plants have been engineered to resist an herbicide that would normally kill all plants, right? Um, it's been very useful technology, very useful to the farmer. You just have to ask a farmer is, is uh, you know, why do you use this technology? And you'll hear, and that, you know, so that's, that's the one side of the equation. The other side is this. And so here we have glyphosate resistant 
mare's tail. It's one of the species that's resistant to glyphosate in many parts of the United States. So that's, I, I, think, the, I think it's fair, even though the technology has been useful to farmers, it's fair to refer to this as kind of a pesticide treadmill. Where does it end, right? So, um, so we can talk more about glyphosate, but um, my point is that I don't think CRISPR represents a near-term solution to the challenge of reducing herbicide use. Okay. Well, actually, let me, let me add to that because a couple of other possibilities for the use of CRISPR to reduce herbicide use is represented here. And that is one genes, genes for allelopathy can be introduced into another species of, of, uh, of, a, of a crop. And so now the roots of the plant become a source of, of a toxin to, to weeds. That's being done uh, with sor sorgolione from, from sorghum. Um, in a research capacity, it's not anything I see as near-term commercial. Um, what about fitness suppressing gene drives, engineering the weed to, to uh, spread a gene drive within its population that, that is fitness suppressing. It's a great concept. It's being done in a research capacity. We're nowhere near commercial use of that. I mean, you know, there's a lot of issues to consider. So bottom line is I don't see CRISPR as providing a solution to the re with respect to the reduction of herbicide use. In contrast, with respect to insecticides, miticides, and disease control chemicals, my, my opinion from where I stand is this is low-hanging fruit. This is low-hanging fruit. From Again, think back to where, to all the possibilities that I described before, knowing that, sure, there'll be challenges, but this, this is a very underutilized technology in my opinion. All right, so this is a slide from Orange County, New York. I worked with Jim Warbier for five years on onions, had a great experience. And this, this uh, toasty, crispy onion plot is, was, is, is from natural inoculant. All we asked the grower to do was turn off the sprayer. And that's the kind of disease pressure that was out there. So clearly, they're going to have a good reason to use fungicides. Right? And if we have that level of susceptibility in the commercial ground. I wanted to start with that sort of fundamental notion that, uh, you know, there, there, there can be a demand, pretty big demand for it that's hard to dispute. So the principle that this represents is, is shown in the title slide, and that is complete resistance can displace the need for pesticide. No question about it. This is, uh, this is not genetically engineered. This is just, these are different turf grass varieties. That's got a very destructive root disease. That one has got the same soil. So clearly it's resistant. And I'm telling you, against that disease, if you want to control fungicide, you're going to be spraying a lot. So, um, so you know, obviously this would be a much better choice. This, this case does involve genetic engineering. It's a cisgenic approach to controlling late blight. And all these plants are, are um, engineered with that cis gene. And here is a plant that's not. And so again, complete resistance can displace the need for pesticides. That's, that is something that is fundamentally really well known among applied plant pathologists. There's another case from genetic engineering. This is uh, insecticide use in corn has gone down dramatically since the introduction of BT traits for insect control. It, it, that, that is, uh, I think, entirely attributable to that. And um, in other parts of the world, uh, we've seen similar reductions in, in insecticide use with Bt crops. Bt brinjal or, or eggplant in Bangladesh has been widely adopted by farmers because they typically, I've read this in multiple places, scholarly sources, typically they were, would be spraying 70 to 80 times a growing season or more to control the boar and now they're down to very low numbers. Um, that, that's not to say there aren't issues and concerns, but, but the, the point is that, that there can be reductions in pesticide use from genetic engineering, and we're not, no one's surprised by that who works in the field. Another example, I like this example from Florida. Um, this is bacterial spot of tomato. Uh, here we have uh, the same variety with a single um, gene from uh, for, for pathogen recognition, a single receptor. 
that comes from, from pepper, right, from pepper. And um, they, they, as I understand it, the only reason this hasn't yet been commercialized is because they're, they don't know how to handle the public relations challenge of a GMO. But, it, but it, it's, anyway, it's, they published it, it looks good, seems to work. And this is what they're doing presently. And what, what our growers do in Kentucky, I don't know if you have much bacterial spot here in this climate, but, um, and they're spraying copper. And copper is not good for the environment, it's not good for the workers. So I think, my opinion, this is actually more sustainable. So here's a paper by Bill Fry going back to 1975, um, but still a really kind of a classic paper. What he showed, what he did was he, he plotted um, the uh, apparent infection rates against fungicide dose for two varieties, a more susceptible variety, uh, russet rural, I think it was called, and Sebago here. And so this, um, this differential, there's a, slight interaction, so the differential is different along different parts. But this differential shows the, the, equi the, the, the savings achievable in fungicide as a result of this partial resistance. So complete resistance is a no-brainer. When we have complete resistance, we, we, we can reduce pesticides to zero maybe sometimes, depending on the circumstances. Here, but even partial resistance can reduce the need for fungicide. And that's what that paper shows. So it is, it is well established that genetic engineering can produce disease resistant plants and genetic solutions can displace pesticides for control of diseases and insects. These, these are, I think, well established. So if if genetics are um, underutilized, then how do we do it sustainably? Okay, that's what we're gonna talk about next. And so um, I think there are two fundamental ways that we can use genetics sustainably. Right? And, I, and when I just say sustainable, I mean for the indefinite future. How do we, how do, we do it in, for the indefinite future? Not that I have all the answers, but I'm, I'm gonna offer what I think about this. First of all, it, and it all depends on diversity. It all depends on diversity. So one way to use genetic resources is to not depend just on the genetic resources. So make sure to deploy a diversity and control tactics. And we have a name for that. It's called integrated pest management. So crop rotation has a role in, in depo deployment of genetics sustainably. Um, Planted dates that might influence disease pressure have a role in deploying genetics sustainably. And secondly, diversity in gene deployment. Okay, diversity in gene deployment. So that, by that I mean multiple things. First of all, let's go back to this list from my paper in sustainability two years ago. Um, remember there are lots of strategies that can lead to the production of plants that are resistant to disease. And um, remember, within each of these strategies, there, I, I don't know what the limit would be to the particular applications that, bio, that uh, molecular biologists might conceive. Um, so I really see the potential for a lot of diversity in, in, the, in the, um, the genetic mechanisms that we use. So, so what I mean by diversity in gene deployment um, it is, is is on the list I'm about to show. First of all, um, use diverse mechanisms, right? Use diverse mechanisms. The BT trait has been used heavily for multiple reasons. In reality, the best way to protect the BT trait is to have another genetic trait that is, has a distinct mechanism from, the, from BT and that targets the same pest. So diverse mechanisms you know, is one way to slow pathogen adaptation. Separate from that, multiple, why not target multiple targets? Again, this is, I'm assuming we're in a world where genetic, where, where GMOs are not um, considered necessarily intrinsically harmful, right? So a world where society uh, is, is willing to utilize technology such as this. And, and we're not there, but I'm gonna talk about it from the standpoint of biology, and then we'll, we'll go forward as 
the public wishes. But multiple targets. So I saw an interesting paper on um, on uh, re reductions of that. Really, actually, pretty surprising reductions in aflatoxin accumulation. And they targeted three uh, points on the uh, particular gene of interest. So why not do that against other pests? Target multiple um, sites. Make it basically harder for the pathogen to adapt. Gene pyramiding, this is a concept that is not certainly novel to genetic engineering or CRISPR, but, um, but uh, it certainly would be easier to implement through the use of a CRISPR uh, engineered uh, construct. And uh, at least for, for annuals and biannuals, um, why not rotate? Again, assuming that the public is willing to have us use diverse genetic techniques. But, um, you know, like in corn, for example, may, this, I don't know if this is naive, but it seems to me that you could build in, uh, actually, this goes back to the multi-lines work that, that I've read about, read about when I was a graduate student and, and thereafter. If you, um, why not, um, you know, have every five years, uh, you rotate to a different set of genes for resistance against X disease. And you just build that into your, your program. And uh, it's worth pointing out that high throughput gene discovery and cloning techniques just expand the, the landscape even more, allowing us to implement um, this, this principle of diversity in gene deployment. So I think all of these are possible through conventional breeding, but they're probably facilitated through genetic engineering, including through, and especially through CRISPR. So I, I, I do believe from my perspective, it, the gene editing is, is likely to permit more rapid breeding responses to evolving pathogen populations. So um, yeah, but we've, gotta, we've always got to think, now I'm, I am excited about the potential for the wise use of, of CRISPR. I'm, you know, I mean, it's pretty hard to hide that. But our job is, as scientists, is to be willing to look at the full picture, right? And that's part of what will happen in the, in the discussion. But, um, but he, and so here's one example. I, I mean, as, as a biologist, this, this one certainly cr catches my attention. So, so for at least for a period of time, there was only one BT toxin event used in cotton worldwide. So, I mean, it's, again, it's pretty easy to imagine that that kind of widespread use of a single gene construct could represent a, a risk, right? How do we know? Well, I credit Roy Millar, for those of you who remember him. He, uh, he taught a wonderful, five, I think it was a 500 level course um, that uh, was grueling <laughs> with the laboratories, <laughs> but, uh, but boy, did I learn a lot. And, um, so southern corn leaf blight is a disease that still exists, um, but, but in 1970, um, what happened was a very um, severe epidemic developed in the United States due to the presence of, um, so there's the epidemic in, you know, in, in Kentucky, <laughs> and uh, that is not fall coloration because you can see those trees are green. That is an epidemic that happened wide, throughout the United, much of the uh, corn growing area. And worse yet, the infection progressed into the, um, the grain itself, which was unusual. And it turned out that, the, um, that uh, a, a mitochondrial gene, there it is identified, a mitochondrial gene uh, that conferred uh, cytoplasmic male sterility actually also had a pleiotropic effect in conferring hypersusceptibility to, the, to an unknown strain of southern corn leaf blight. So this Genetic, and this is all natural. This is all the result of conventional breeding. So we're not picking on genetic engineering or conventional breeding. Um, so this, this natural genetic trait was what predisposed, unknown in advance, uh, was predisposed the crop to this epidemic. So we know that the widespread use of a, of a particular genetic construct could lead to an unexpected outcome. We have to recognize that as, as biologists. But, but overall, my opinion is that the sustainable use of 
genetic resources, resources for disease control actually puts more, would, would depend on greater reliance on genetic knowledge and innovation, not, le, not, less, not, not less knowledge and not less application, but greater uh, reliance as you've, as you've seen. Okay, social considerations. We're not gonna go into the deeply, but I think it's important to give voice to the social dimension of, of these technologies. And you know, a lo lovely one that social scientists ask is who decides where to use the technology and when? And I don't think there is an easy answer to that, but it's a good thing to wonder as biologists, who decides, who benefits before we use it? Who might be the beneficiary? At what rate is it used? You know, again, I don't, I don't think I know the answers to these. Who might be disadvantaged? And does genetic engineering promote food access? And those are the things that are interesting most, the things that contribute to sustainability in a social sense or an environmental sense. So that's, that's why I, I think it's important to think beyond and talk beyond just the glyphosate Roundup Ready trait that's the most common. One of the other um, dimensions that I think is important to recognize as, uh, as biologists is the fact that transgene flow, recognizing transgenes are genes from outside the breeding pool, and the flow of transgenes could represent a risk, right, to uh, environments or uh, the environment or, um, or cultural risks. And so I, I don't have the easy answer for this one either. Um, so this is, uh, these are uh, campesino farmers in, in, uh, in Nicaragua, and they, they produce their own ancient varieties. And so, you know, if we get transgene flow with the Roundup Ready trade into their variety, even if it occurs at low percentages, and even if it has no agronomic impact whatsoever, they don't want it in their corn. So I think we've got to recognize that as an issue. Um, that applies to transgenes. I don't think the same applies if, if, if we engineered our corn with a cis gene, which is from the breeding pool of corn. I don't think the same applies if we take, create a deletion or an indel causing targeting mutations, because all of those things can happen naturally in the, in the gene pool of the, of the, of the crop. But within, in the case of transgenes, I think this represents an issue, a social risk. But not all applications of, uh, oh yeah, actually. Yeah, there is another point. And so one of, some of my good friends are more concerned about the impact of genetic engineering on, um, on smallholders. There he is saving a seed. Could he save the seed if it you know, was a genetically engineered crop? And you know, here in the United States, no, at least not until you know, the, the, the label is off, the product is off patent. So again, it's a, that's sort of a social consideration, not a biological one, but it's important nevertheless. Not all applications of genetic engineering are harmful to smallholders. Some are beneficial, and here's just a few examples done with smallholders in mind. This work, uh, the Verka project, is, is uh, to create disease resistance against um, cassava diseases. They, they, I'm sure they do others in this project, but that was, that's the one that got my attention. And they are categorically, they categorically must distribute those genetic traits once they're pub publicly released. They must dis distribute those freely and to allow um, them to be shared. So this is, these are acute poisonings, incidents of acute poisonings in, uh, among cotton growers in India. And um, BT, of course, is the engineered plant uh, and uh, non-BT is non-engineered. And um, the, the, the incidence of no poisonings was high, much higher for those who had, had the BT crop. They weren't spraying as many insecticides. Makes sense, right? Um, and they, you see that all the way up through to um, all these different categories. The incidence of multiple poisonings was lower where they used BT because they weren't dependent on insecticides. I've seen the same kind of data from China. So again, I, I, it's an example of how not all examples of genetic engineering are harmful to um, 
uh, smallholders, they may be beneficial. Here's one um, that, again, caught my attention. This was work, again, with cotton, biotech cotton, BT cotton in Colombia. And um, it reports that the uh, women farmers actually preferred the BT cotton because it saved them time and it allowed them to have less cost in spray, have hiring somebody to spray their cotton. So some reflections. We're going to end up with plenty of time, which is good. So um, I took that picture. <laughs> I did not get oversprayed. Uh, so I had it all planned out very well. Um, but that's from Orange County, New York. And um, so if we want to reduce pesticides against diseases and insects, we must give farmers alternatives. I, I don't know of any other way as an applied plant pathologist. Here is um, a um, producer, smallholder producer in uh, Nicaragua, and he's spraying chemicals. That he was actually spraying corothalmo, Jim. No protection. And, um, you know, I'd like to see him have an option here. And he's probably going to keep spraying until he has an option. And most of the time, options mean some sort of genetic solution, genetic engineering, conventional breeding, something. Um, and this, the, I took all these pictures. This was in Nicaragua as well. And that little girl is about 10 meters from that rice field, which gets treated by airplane. That's not good. That is a bad situation. And um, so I, I would like to see options. If we want this grower to stop using pesticides from the air, we have to give him or her alternatives. We, um, now I have spent, it's still hard to believe, <laughs> 35 years working with pesticides for disease control, starting in 1983 with Jim Warbier, and one wonderful learning experience. Um, I've been working that long with these, and um, I, you know, I think I think most applied plant pathologists would agree that um, host plant resistance is the principal pathway to reducing pesticide use. Again, I'm not saying it necessarily has to be CRISPR, but we need genetic solutions, and we're not we're not getting enough of them at this point. My perception is that CRISPR-based gene editing is it opens doors to engineering disease resistance and sometimes with advantages compared to transformation or conventional breeding. And um, maybe it gives us an opportunity to target crops that are heavily dependent on pesticides, as we saw some slides. So um, yeah, we've got, looks like just about maybe 15 to 20 minutes to discuss. So I'll leave it, leave it to you to start that off. Thank you. In the back. That was a great talk. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, you presented genome editing squarely in the context of genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. Actually, the subset. Yes, it is. Yes. And I think that's um, accurate. And I think it's easy. It's an easy concept for biologists. But when it comes to public perception, there are some people would argue that it's important to distinguish genetic engineering as referring to gene gun yeah. and uh, tdna insertion yeah. randomly throughout the genome from the new technology yeah and there's even a tendency to call CRISPR to to refer to uh genome editing and crispr technologies as precision breeding yes so, mm -hmm. you know words have power what's your take on that i know you didn't have a lot of time to talk about no that. it's great that's one that's boy yeah that's a really good question i you know i i think that's one of those things that I'm, I'm probably as interested, I am as interested in hearing what you think about it as, as whatever I think about it. I, how do we describe these technologies? I, I've, so I may change my mind on the plane home after the discussion, but I, I tend to, so I do a lot of outreach on this topic with the public, and um, I usually ask for about an hour and a half. And in that period of time, I, I have the leisure to be able to talk using some pretty useful graphics, you know, what, what is genetic engineering, what is CRISPR, and how is it used, and, and, and you know, there can be some overlap in the outcomes, right, you know, but, uh, but, um, but they are distinct. I, I have tended to describe it all as genetic engineering to the public, and as long as people understand and get comfortable with what, you know, how genetic engineering is like copying and pasting sentences, copy from this file, paste to that file, right, the sentence is the gene, 
and, the, and now we've just placed it into another file and everybody knows how to do that. And they're like, oh, oh, okay, it's not that mysterious. If they understand that, it, 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 almost, it almost doesn't matter which language, whether I call it genetic engineering or, or, or precision breeding or something. Um, the problem is that I have an hour and a half and, and with many times you have 10 seconds. So I wanna present it transparently. It, it seems as a scientist to be under the large umbrella of, of genetic engineering, but that might scare people. And yeah, it's, it's a dilemma because I want, I want to convey is, you know, the, the accuracy of the phrase genetic engineering as well. Do you think it's, do you think it's using a term like precision breeding opens you up to, being, to criticism of being sort of disingenuous? Yeah, right? perfect. And then, and then losing trust. Yes, yes, well stated. Yeah, I think it does. If we, if we, if we use words that avoid, you know, what, they, what people might think we're really talking about, then we, we do run the risk of losing trust. And, and I, I will tell you, um, trust is everything in this work. I can't tell you how important it is. It, there's a, yeah, I can, there's a way to do it. This is a, this is a saying that I, I learned somewhere. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So, so yeah, putting it, you, you've, you raise a good point and, and putting it in those terms, I think anything that diminishes the trust people have in us as public servants, which we all are, you know, we're all trying to get a job and, you know, be happy in our lives, but we are working in a public institution. And I think um, that trust uh, is, we, we've got to do everything we can to protect it. So, but these are great comments and be interesting to hear from you. Yeah. Great talk. I'm really interested on the urban side too. So yeah. we're talking about adoption by the public. There's different categories of adoption. We have consumer adoption, we have industry adoption. So for agribusiness, we have so much of our economic crops that are already GMO, corn, yeah. sugar beets, right. and it just goes on. Um, so the issue is, is this going to be affordable to use CRISPR? Because what I've seen from the media is that there's additional licensing with any commercial product that was developed using CRISPR technology. Yeah. So I consider is that when you're looking at R D, this new term D, the additional D, mm. cost effectiveness is incredible, a, a big barrier. You could have the best technology, but if it's not affordable compared to how cheap it is to just spray pesticides, ah. mm. it's going to be the biggest barrier to industry adoption. Well said. Is it going to be affordable? CRISPR. Yeah, um, well, it, 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 I don't anticipate it being more uh, expensive than current you know, practices of genetic engineering. Um, I think we just have to wait and see. I haven't seen, you know, um, I haven't seen much that indicates, you know, the long-term cost to farmers and, and so on. One of the things though, it, it definitely represents an opportunity and corporations can't price their products out of the market, you know, obviously. I went to, it's called CRISPR-Con, the CRISPR conference at Berkeley. I don't know, maybe you're familiar with it. Yeah, it's, uh, it was a great conference and um, because it, it had people from all walks of life, you know, attending. And, and they did these little surveys that you could respond to on your phone. And, um, and so, I, you know, I think people responded. We had a pretty good survey results. And when they asked the question, what sector do you represent or what area do you represent? Half were agriculture. What, and, and so that means, you know, all the applications in the therapeutic world and, you know, and other applications were the, the other half. In other words, the big one by far was agricultural uses. So it must have a lot of potential to make money for so many people to be there from the agricultural world. Um, you know, these were company representatives, I'm sure, maybe large scale farmers, but not, not small farmers. But um, so I, yeah, there's, I, I, I worry a little bit that it's gonna be used principally for herbicide tolerance. And again, I, I think that's, um, I respect the benefit it has brought to the growers who use it. I, I, I totally do. 
and it's not it's not the kind of application that excites me because of all the things that we, we could be doing. So I, maybe maybe the cost issues will we'll learn more as we go through. I don't know what they will be though. Yeah. Um, has there been any work in combining CRISPR, um, whatever, modified tolerance in plants with non-genetic approaches to avoiding um, pests, such as like push and pull or polyculture? Like not uh, no, no systematic research in that area. Um, yeah, and so, you know, I made the point that diversifying disease control tactics is, is going to be important to reducing the pressure, the selection pressure on the pest. And, and that's, that's true whether we're dealing with a genetic trait or a fungicide. That's why I'm quite confident with it. We know from fungicide, we recommend with fungicides, don't rely on just on the fungicide, use other mechanisms for disease control, other tactics. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that as, as, a, as an academician, knowing that in reality, it's, you know, growers have a lot of things to be concerned about. They may not always do what they should, but our, you know, our job first is to understand the biology. And I think the biology is pretty sound that we, um, you know, we want to um, at, le at least know that we should be recommending alternatives and other tactics for disease control and implement it as best we can. Um, but nobody, back to your specific question, I've not seen studies that integrate the two. I think, I think we have a lot of experience, research-based experience with everything else, you know, host plant resistance through conventional means and all other cultural and chemical methods to know that, that, um, th that an integrated approach is, is ultimately better for lots of reasons, but no one's specifically done that yet with CRISPR technologies. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.